Hello, I'm Matt Carpenter, and this is the Good Life Podcast. Hello, this is Matt, and I'm glad you could join us today on the Good Life Podcast. Today, I have Nathan Gill with me. Uh, Nathan is an educator, a writer. He graduated from Hillsdale College, very familiar to many of us. And he is the academic dean of Chapel Field Christian School in uh, New York, where he, was New York State, the, the Hudson Valley, where he also is a husband and a father of three young children. Nathan, thank you for joining us today. Great to be here. Thanks so much for the invitation. Several weeks ago, I read an article. Uh, I was, became acquainted with Nathan reading an article that he wrote for the American Reformer called Towards a More Classical, Towards a More American Classical Education. And it interested me because I've I've had thoughts along some of these lines before, having taught for a long time, and I, I appreciated a lot of what you have to say. But, but just to start with, you have a background in classical education, uh, uh, certainly you know, having gone to Hillsdale. So just you know, talk about your background. What is it that interested you, that motivated you to go into classical education? Yeah, well, yeah, thanks for that introduction. Um, <clears throat> I, w- I was homeschooled, so my, my parents were pretty early on there, in the early 90s, um, jumping on board the whole homeschooling train, and uh, they homeschooled my brothers and I, and so I was homeschooled in uh, rural New York State, and uh, I got some elements of a classical education there uh, in that environment, so not fully. We did, we did, you know, curriculum here and there, but my mom was great at, uh, we read a lot of mythology, we read a lot of fairy tales, we read a lot of classic stories, and really got, like, kind of the literary um, side of a classical education. I came to love the history of Greece and Rome and the Middle Ages through having great hero stories told um so really enjoyed that and that went a long way towards giving me a love of history and then um when i went through college i i I studied history um but i I did college online so that i could i could work i worked at a a small museum in cooperstown new york uh, which kind of deepened my love of history um i i then i then uh worked in politics actually for a year for a, a freshman congressman who was elected during the Tea Party elections. And um, I worked for him as a kind of a local representative in a small office for about a year. And it was a good experience in a lot of ways, but it brought me face to face with the depth of the cultural problem we're facing in this country. And I remember, I remember kind of being torn between politics and other things I wanted to do and a lot of the hopes that I'd had for what politics could accomplish in 2010, I just, the more I talked to constituents, the more I was um, impressed by just how our education system had failed to equip them with basic civic knowledge. Mm. Um, <clears throat> so that really impressed itself upon me. I uh, ended up going to graduate school, got into Hillsdale, which was a great blessing, and um, their approach to education, primary sources, um, reading the classics was, was hugely um, impactful on me and uh, also helped me to c- kind of wrestle with the question of the relationship between the United States and the American uh, Republican experiment and its connection to the classics, which that um, relationship, some would call it a tension, I don't know, just was something that I thought a lot about and me and my classmates talked a lot about. And then kind of from Hillsdale, I decided... Um, I was still kind of torn between going into politics and education, and uh, I decided just there was so much energy at Hillsdale um, kind of around alternative ways of of educating with the charter school movement and the classical school movement that I was just kind of caught the infectious enthusiasm and and really came to see um, kind of in the 
circumstances we're living in in the 21st century education is, is maybe maybe in a way it's 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 good for its own sake but in another way too to me it seems like the most politically necessary thing at the moment mm. um so I, I don't i definitely don't think of classical education as a primarily a uh a partisan thing by any means i think it is about the good the true and the beautiful um but on the other hand it does have and my article, I guess, gets into this, but I really do believe that it has a political dimension to it that's unavoidable. Um, you're forming citizens, and that's that's a constant. It's a constant presence in the literature and the tradition on education, and actually, that's that's one of the critiques I guess I would have about um, some of the some of the organizations and leaders in the classical movement right now is just when you hear all the talk about the good, the true, and the beautiful, which I wholly embrace, and I love that. Um, when you go back and read Aristotle, book eight, about the purpose of education and a regime, and when you go back and read Luther, his letter to the Christian nobility on establishing public schools, what surprises you is how politically these guys were thinking. Yes. Um, and I think that there's something there that the classical movement right now needs to recover. So that's kind of how I got to where I am right now. That is a very, that's a very interesting perspective. I think it's easy to read back. There, in talking to people, we have so many historical blind spots, and usually, for blind spots, if it's something we admire, we fill it in with whatever we consider wonderful and and lovely. So, in an age of political turmoil, which um not convinced that there hasn't been an age bereft of political turmoil, <laughs> then you are faced with, well, people look back and, and they, they see an era and they think, wow, wouldn't it be great if we could all just sit under Plato at the academy? Or, or if we could sit under C.S. Lewis at Oxford or Tolkien or and, and there or whatever whoever you want in between, but they all are dealing with significant problems. I mean, Plato was seeing the end of Greek civilization as he yeah. knew it. It was beginning to crumble. Or Augustine see, seeing the same. I mean, the City of God is one of the most overtly pol not solely political but it is a political document the first half is a deconstruction of the Roman way so that, that it, there, there's no lily white ethereal classical <laughs> movement that we can <clears throat> say oh this is what we want a lot like I, heard, I read one right. conservative no 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 one classical educator, a writer well-known in the classical movement, recently said that there is nothing inherently conservative about the cl you know, classical education. And I thought, methinks thou dost protest too much. <laughs> yes, and I, and I would agree. Actually, you mentioned, um, it's interesting, you mentioned Lewis. And of course, yeah, Plato and Aristotle, what are, what are they teaching and philosophizing in the in the shadow of there you know it's the the macedon it's the peloponnesian wars the breaking apart of greece it is the macedonian conquest of greece and they're both working in those contexts um profoundly political and, and when you look at the people socrates is talking to in his dialogues he's talking to oftentimes it's, it's many people but he's often singling out people like glaucon who are among the elite he's he definitely he's concerned about the soul primarily and he's wanting to He's wanting to expose the problems in Glaucon's soul in the Republic, but on the other hand, he definitely is interested in reaching Glaucon also because of Glaucon's political significance. Um, so there's an unescapable political dimension. And, and Lewis, um, one of my favorite little essays by Lewis that I think about a lot, and, and I wonder if you've read, is, is Learning in Wartime. Yes. In the Weight of Glory collection. And what Lewis's point there is, he's absolutely affirming that you know, we could say education for its own sake, that we're supposed to be seeking these transcendent goods. But he's also saying this is always going to happen under the shadow of earthly chaos. Yes. 
yeah. political rivalry, civil war, and he's and he's saying that literally as World War II was beginning on the continent, and he had students who were already in the army fighting in uh, France and Belgium while uh, he was addressing that class with those words. Yes, and now remind me, does he have another essay about living in an atomic age? He does, and I'm not as familiar with that one. I don't think I've read that uh, So, so I, I believe, I mean, th there's a lot of overlap in the two essays. But in, in Living in an Atomic Age, th th there's always, you know, so, so it was written after uh, Learning in Wartime. But, but he, he's saying, we live in a time when we could be destroyed at any given time. You know, <laughs> and there's, not much we can do about it, so we have a choice. Either we can live in panic, or we can continue doing the things that men and women have always done. And, you know, for him, it was to, to, to give himself to the work of education. And again, I know, I'm, I know there, there was overlap between the two, but his just overall consistency in keep on plod, do what you need to do, and don't worry about all the things that could happen. Right. So, I, I appreciated that a lot. Yes, yeah, I did as well, and even though he doesn't address this in Learning in Wartime, I think there's a kind of implicit critique in there that you can find of people who try to overly, as you put it, etherealize education because even though Lewis is of course is the defender of the medieval vision of education and the good the true and the beautiful and the soul as the end at the same time um, he in learning in wartime <clears throat> he talks about how education is about preparing us to do our duties he talks about the charwoman you know even a simple charwoman and how she should be educated and enabled to do her duty to her utmost so that she can glorify God in her vocation um, it's not just something that we do, uh, you know, sitting around um, sipping martinis and enjoying leisure, although that's an element of it. Sure. It's something that's inescapably attached to action and duty as well. And that's why I love the, the earlier writers in the tradition, like Luther gets this, Aristotle gets this, so many others get this, that they're a, a very f significant component of classical education has always been about equipping you to do your duty. Right, right the the gifts of grammar, dialectic, and rhetoric are not to simply have fencing contests in front of large crowds where you can receive their adulation. But words are gifts to be used in the battle that we face. Precisely. And, I mean, even, so thinking back to the prophets in the, in, in the Old Testament, they were using their words to speak against the nations who opposed Israel and later Judah, but, uh, but also used against the wicked leaders of Israel and Judah herself. You know, well, with both of them, that that when you are going out of the right way, you need someone to call you back. And the wiser you are, the, the more experienced you are in knowing how to properly use grammar and and and, and properly use. Uh, your, just your language, rhetoric, and everything else, you will be better able to oppose those who are in the wrong. Absolutely. Yeah, and, which is not to say that um, knowing grammar and logic and rhetoric is not to, isn't also about enabling us to delight in words themselves and the pleasure of just a good leisurely conversation, but um, it is, it, is, it is at least equally about equipping us 
to do battle in the war of words right um, and to fight i mean aristotle in the politics talks about how speech is the distinctive characteristic of a human being because it's how our reason is expressed and what is the purpose of speech for him the purpose of speech is to set forth the advantageous the disadvantageous the just the unjust to enable us to pursue what is good yes and uh part of that is fighting for what is good as well right so to see education as preparation for battle is, is, is a good way to, to look at it. Now, of course, you, you have some who think that the only reason you have that you learn is just so you can fight all the time and inflame others. Well, there's there's also the... I think of someone like Aragorn from Lord of the Rings who serves as a king. He is a gifted fighter. I mean, before he's a king, when he is just... He's a... Uh, you know, he, he protects... The area and he serves a fellowship he is a, a very experienced fighter but the note that many forget in that book is he is also a healer he mm. uses his gifts to yeah. heal and he's experienced in that he's wise in knowing how to heal so one must you know our, our words the apostle paul says let no corrupting communication come from your mouth so, so, so that w which, which just makes something implode, that which, which disintegrates, should not come out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that which builds up sure. instead. So, anyway, I mean, I, I know that that's, you, you don't talk about this in the article, but these are all important <laughs> elements. No, but it's... For sure. And, well, I love what you're saying there. That's a great point. I mean, and for Tolkien, I think when you first read Lord of the Rings, the whole thing about Aragorn as the healer makes no sense. And then when you start to see what he's doing there, it's it really is so crucial to his vision for what a king is, what a good, uh, dare I say, Christian king yes. is. Um, so, and I think, and I think for the person who only uses the trivium and and the other arts for battle um, I think what you're missing there and very similar to the point you're making is that I think Aristotle would, would push back and say well what is the end what are you working towards it's kind of like his critique of Spartan society in the politics where they're so engaged in the work of preparing for war that they forget that you prepare for war in order to have peace Right. you have to know how to be able to handle peace as well because peace is the ultimate aim for which you're fighting and I, and I think with the war of words and the temptation that some people can have to over overly stress the, um, the liberal arts as preparation for battle as we're saying um, I guess I would push back I think as Aristotle would and say to what end the end here is to have agreement and to be able to enjoy with our words yes. uh, the world that God has created. Yes, it's persuasion and battle if we must for the end of enjoyment. Yes, but, but that does give you. I mean, w when you have the the proper end in mind, you can pursue even in your what when two different sides who may who disagree on a particular point, so take the American War for Independence. The way that they engage, and I'm not saying that, that, that there, there were not uh, sins committed by both sides, but in general, when you consider the way that the war was fought, King George III could have called for his troops to wage war in a much harsher, much more just torched earth manner and could have won had they taken a win the war at all cost mindset versus, and this is in the recent biography of George III, the author points this out, and I cannot remember the, the name of the author right now, but uh, he points out that, that they did not wage that war in the same way that they put down other uprisings in, in other colonies because they viewed the Americans as Englishmen. They had a respect for them. and So, oh, taking that into our 
discussion, when we use our, when we view those that we are speaking, to whom we are speaking, as themselves uh, our fellow men, as mutual citizens, mutual parts of God's world, it will change the way that we engage with them. Doesn't mean that we will not fight and there will not be, or you know, how, whatever that looks like. But you don't get to brutalize those uh, again, and that comes from having the the proper purpose in mind, the proper end in mind. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's something that I that's something that you you run into in the classroom often. The difference between uh, the difference between how to <clears throat> persuade versus manipulate students, and I, I really am grateful to Andrew Kern from the Circe Institute for the way he always emphasizes the distinction between the Socratic mode of trying to entice and attract somebody to your point of view versus, uh, as he puts it, pulling them towards you with a hook through the nose. Right. Um, <clears throat> and with our students, it can be tempting, especially when you're trying to go fast and people are misbehaving, to to uh, use threats and enticements to, to get them to listen to you, but it's so much better to appeal to their soul, to appeal to their moral sense and their moral imagination. Yeah. Um, so absolutely. Yeah, and I think, I think something that, that our conversation is kind of um, stirring in me too is, is one thing that really motivates me in the article and then in <clears throat> the other work that I do is I, I've been really influenced by, um, I don't know if you've read any Roger Scruton, yes. but yes. I've been influenced by his way of seeing education as the transmission of a way of life as well. <clears throat> a handing over from one generation to the next, mm -hmm. uh, not just of ideas, but as, as a way of life. That's something that I, I think is very much <clears throat> there in the background of my article I, as, as our American way of life fragments and um, degrades and disappears. Um, the way that classical education, I think, done well can really help, in, especially in Christian community, to help hand over that tradition. As, as the Latin root of that word suggests, to hand it down from one to the other. Um, and it's something I care profoundly about because I think a lot of my early memories and thoughts, um, I mentioned to you before the podcast that uh, my grandparents had kind of a classic New England style farmhouse in northern New York. And <clears throat> a lot of my early memories are from romping around in the, the fields and the, the woods around there. And uh, it wasn't, by the time I was a kid, it was just a small farm. It was it was basically a hobby farm. But all around that area in the last, gr growing up, I've just seen farming and attachment to the land and the way of life that I, I so loved and saw in my grandparents just kind of disappearing from rural New York. Um, my county used to be one of the number one, I think it was the number one producer of uh, of milk in New York State at one time, and now it's just a formerly agricultural wasteland mm. of a lot of unemployed people, and um, unfortunately, gigantic. Uh, one of the biggest employers is the social services in the county, and it's a profoundly sad thing uh, on a number of levels. But I, I'm very attracted to this idea of using the liberal arts not just to equip and shape people who can fulfill their duties, but also to hand over a way of life from one generation to the next. That is a, I mean, that view itself is one that Scruton received from, I know Edmund Burke speaks that mm -hmm. way in his, in his reflections on the revolution in France, uh, G.K. Chesterton, and of course there's many in between those two, but it's that that's really what discipleship is, is intended to be is a way of handing down what we have received from mm -hmm. our <clears throat> fathers in the faith. It, it's not Ideolog an ideological let me drain you of every of all the other stuff you've received and I'm going to pour you know I'm going to 
fill you up with my thinking. It's but 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 it's a uh, it's cliched, but passing the baton essentially. But but it's more than just a baton. It it's a a, a life giving way to them. Yes. I I love that whole <clears throat> vision of education that's so much more um, I, I love that you compared it to discipleship because I think when you understand the classical education traditionally it looks so much like Paul's letters in a lot of ways and the way that Paul emphasizes the handing over and the, the way that he goes between um, his rhetoric his the different ways that he appeals to the churches and um, it's <clears throat> it's a beautiful thing and I and even some of the etymology of the words that we use, I, I, I'm indebted here to Christopher Perrin from Classical Academic Press for the way that he emphasizes, you know, when you get right down to the Latin roots of some of these words, we use like assess, an assessment. What, what could be more impersonal than a modern day assessment, right? We think of standardized tests and, you know, number two pencils and filling in circles and that kind of thing. And he makes the point that if you get right down to the original Latin roots of that word, it means to sit beside somebody that assessment at one time was a teacher and a pupil having a conversation about what was good, true, and beautiful. Yes. And um, that's something that I think is, in, in the classroom, I've just seen the need for schools, the more that they can shrink class sizes, the more that they can give one-on-one -on -one time between teachers and students, the more that they can make space for that kind of personal interaction not only does it make for better assessment in our sense and better examination of what people know, but it makes for that relational aspect as well that I think has always been so um, foundational to, to a real education. Because you because what is the nature of education ultimately? It's becoming like your teacher. Yeah. That's, that's the goal. We don't always like to admit that, but that is when you entrust your, your children to a teacher, what you are doing, whether you like it or not, is saying we want you to become more like this person. Yeah. Well, and... and um, in, in their frailty and their fallenness and everything, but but hopefully their their virtues and their their knowledge preeminently. Yes. Well, I, I've been not surprised exactly, but in some ways I just did not realize how often Paul speaks in a way that call, where he calls people to imitate himself. In the famous passage where he talks about, you know, in Philippians 4, the one that, you know, so many people <coughs> know when he says, whatsoever, whatever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, of good report, virtuous, if there's any praise, think on these things. Many people are familiar with that verse, but they're not familiar with the verse immediately following where he says those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do and the God of peace will be with you so he's not just commending them to a bunch of abstract concepts he's not just saying you know think about flowery fields and beautiful sunsets and the lake waters lapping he's saying Think on these right and righteous and, yes, good and true and beautiful things, but then tangibly, those same things, the things that are good that you have observed in me, that's what you should practice. So he never separates. I mean, uh, truth and beauty and goodness are never, uh, are, are never these ideals that hover Absolutely. in some pure Platonic form, they're always incarnational. And what, what, what one of the, right. the beautiful things that Christ, you know, Augustine's <clears throat> Christian Platonism ideas, that it, that it gives embodiment to the forms in a wonderful way. Absolutely. Yeah, now that's, I'm so glad you brought up the word imitation because... Um, there are few words I think that are so um, so bound up in just what education, especially, and the classical tradition gets this, and I really want to commend classical schools here for, for doing such a good job of 
getting this central insight that um, in a world you know where we try to put the cart before the horse we try to we encourage kids even in elementary school to express themselves and to write free form essays and um, give their opinions and their thoughts when really um, the classical insight has always been imitate greatness and only through imitating greatness will you eventually have something uh, worthy to say something of your own um, so that is so important and and I think what you're saying about embodiment and incarnational I, I get at that a little bit in the article and I think your point that truth goodness and beauty at least on this side of uh, eternity are always incarnated I think is so crucial because I guess one of the one of the critiques I have had where I think classical schools that I have observed anyway could do better is is just recognizing how much of the truth goodness and beauty we talk about abstractly um, needs to be apprehended in our own tradition which is not to exclude other traditions which is not to exclude certainly Western tradition um, or even in some cases others as well but preeminently again um, we're Americans um, we we are inheritors of a certain heritage that's been handed down and we are our in our heritage and our nation has blind spots and that's why we need classical education because in studying antiquity is going to help us see blind spots that we can all admit our tradition and our nation has um, at the same time um, at the same time, I think so. there's so much of truth, goodness, and beauty, and righteousness, and all these other um, wonderful forms, to use the Platonic word, that, that we need, that we, are, that we can access through our own tradition that's made for us, that's um, understandable to us in a way that it's not understandable to anybody else, and it's, it, and it's there often, and we neglect it more than we should, I feel. Yes. Well, getting into your, more into your article itself, part of the, part of the strong emphasis that you make here is, is something that I have, I've thought about, and, and Amanda, my wife, and I, have, we, we've talked about this, and that, that is that, that in, in some places with the, the, the recent rebirth in this generation, of classical Christian education, there is a lack of emphasis on the particular. There are these, it's an idea of this, this universal Greek, Roman, and Christian books that come together and that you just, you rem, you're, we're to remain focused on those things but that's not where we live and and frankly that's not entirely who we are i mean the certainly they help they're much further upstream than we are and, and they contributed to the river that we find ourselves standing in but there's a lot more to this river than those people who are a hundred miles upstream. Sure. So, so, so unpack that some. I and mean, what, what does mm. what does an American? How, how, how would an American? I don't. Flavor is not a good way to say it, but an American emphasis in classical education. What does that potentially look like, or what does it entail? Sorry, I, I, I think service blipped out or something. I didn't hear that last few seconds. What, so so what, what does an American classical education look like for, you know, it, it, that's something that's not abstract, but that has tangible, particular uh, emphasis that, that includes sure. things like, you know, I, I know you could say we just have an American history class, but that's not the only thing you're going for in the article. Yeah, no, it's, it's certainly not just American history. Um, I don't even think it's just, I don't even think it's just the humanities. It's easiest to see it there, that what could be done with American literature classes and other literature classes to 
uh, incorporate <clears throat> more strategically the the American sources alongside the other uh, worthy worthy books. But I think it's even something ultimately. This is not my strong suit, so I don't have a lot of great thoughts here. I think it's even something that's got to color how you teach STEM. Um, and I'd be fascinated to have somebody more knowledgeable than myself um, flesh out what that looks like. But um, so, so, so say that again. Th- you, th- you actually cut out right there. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> I was saying that um, I think it's something that doesn't just color your humanities classes, but also STEM classes as yes. well. And I would love to see somebody who, who knows STEM, unlike myself, um, who is more classically educated than myself, to, to unpack what that looks like in STEM classes, what, uh, what a more an education in uh, science and math does for American citizens, um, specifically. So. There's a few things here. I think, I think first of all, there's the obvious points, many of which I make in the article, that when we're <clears throat> selecting from the canon, the Western canon of great texts, <clears throat> um, we should absolutely be reading the classics from our larger Western tradition, the Greeks, the Romans, the medievals, um, and even in some cases beyond. But even there, one of the points I make in the article is there's such an infinite variety within the Western canon to choose from that just saying read the Western canon often isn't that... I'm I'm the academic dean of my school, so I'm involved with curriculum choices. And I know the the pain that uh, curriculum developers can face when they're they're trying to select, out of all these great books, they're trying to select what their students need to know and one of my points is, even when you're choosing from uh, medieval and uh, classical sources, um, I think you should be choosing from them with American aims in mind. For instance, I'll give you one easy example, because you mentioned before your recording that uh, you've, been, you've been teaching your kids Plutarch. Um, Plutarch is so... Not only is there a universal quality to Plutarch, where he's just an amazing writer, but he's so widely known and revered by not only the entire founding generation, um, but by Americans really until the last uh, 80 years. I mean, he was one of President Truman's favorite writers, believe it or not. Um, <clears throat> to understand the United States, you cannot understand the United States without Plutarch. Yes. I think I'd be bold enough to stay. Uh, I, was, I was just um, listening to a, a podcast that one of my friends was on talking about education for the American regime uh, this is Dr. Clifford Humphrey, who's a former classmate of mine and has done a lot of good work on education. And he was pointing out that Benjamin Rush, who has this magnificent essay on how Americans should be educating their citizens. I linked to it briefly in my article, but a fascinating, fascinating essay with so many great points that we're surprised to hear a founding father say, including including kind of a bit of a rabbit trail here, I suppose, but including, he thinks, that not only should your education try to prejudice your students in favor of Republican government and in favor of Christianity, he even says that uh, public education in the United States should be working to promote denominational affiliation, which is fascinating. (laughs) Um, Nothing that you would hear, you know, that's not on any. That's not a magnet on any public school teacher's uh, refrigerator these days. Right. Um, <laughs> but but my point is, Rush, uh, my friend Cliff points out that Rush extensively is drawing from Plutarch, even in that essay. Right. His thought, his thoughts about the education that fits the American regime. He's drawing not just on Plutarch. He's thinking as an American in light of the Enlightenment and his Protestant faith. But he is extensively engaging, particularly with the life of Lycurgus by Plutarch. Um, so, so I think thinking about our own national tradition, I think, helps us choose from the wider Western tradition the text to privilege over the others, because we have such a finite amount of time with our students that we need, we need something beyond just the Western canon as a guide to selecting text. So, so there's that. Um, and then I'll just make another couple quick points then turn it back to you, but um, I think that another way that this needs to be, another thing that classical educators need to double down on is especially, um, as funny as this may sound, an American aesthetic. Um, Beauty is so crucial to forming the soul. This is something that classical tradition really 
understands well and classical schools really understand well. But again, often I, I look at the classical schools and they're doing a far better job than any other schools, but I see uh, often students who wonderfully can talk about Rembrandt and Vermeer and Michelangelo. And uh, American, the American aesthetic is often underrepresented and there's, there is a such thing as the American aesthetic. A lot of the great 19th century American artists were, con artists were consciously trying to create one because they understood that a particular aesthetic tradition produces certain kinds of people. Um, so I love just an a amateur interest. I love American architecture and 19th century American art. And um, I think there's a lot of wisdom there in great artists like Thomas Cole, who's probably the greatest American artist in my opinion. And his engagement with what American art should be um, in some of his published and unpublished writings mm. and his paintings. And then uh, Winslow Homer, another great, and um, I'm biased, but particularly the Hudson River School that Thomas Cole kind of inaugurates is, is so influential in forming <clears throat> the notion in the 1800s and beyond of the kinds of beauty and the kinds of imagination that American citizens need to be self-governing. Yes. And then the final point, just very quick, would just be uh, the point I'm making the article is that I think an American education really needs to lean into the wisdom of our tradition that refuses to see a dichotomy between the practical arts, uh, the manual arts, what, what Hugh of St. Victor calls the mechanical arts, the, the arts that require the hands. Um, I think we really need to double down on seeing the mutual... Um, the mutually beneficial relationship between the arts that develop the hands, so to speak, craftsmanship, and the liberal arts that develop the mind. Yeah. I think the two are mutually reinforcing and one of the great insights of the Protestant tradition, and specifically I would say Protestantism in the United States, I think one of the great contributions has been seeing the marriage of those things and not giving into the siren call of uh, classical antiquity, or even sometimes I would say the overly contemplative strain of other tr Christian traditions that tries to force more of a separation between those two families of the arts. Right, right. There's the boy. I'm having to organize my thoughts so they don't all come out at once. But <laughs> sorry, that was a lot. No, no. <laughs> it, it, but it was really good. The so, so I'm, I think of someone when you talk about architecture, like Christopher Alexander, the the okay, architectural historian. He wrote several books um, on, like he has a, a four volume work, and I, I have to to save up pennies over about ten years and then buy but buy one of them. Uh, <laughs> but it's it, it's called the Nature of Order. Uh, it's a, it's a four volume series, but but it's on looking at art. The, the subtitle is an uh, essay on the art of building and the nature of the universe. Hmm. But he also wrote about specific American forms of architecture. One of his books is called A Timeless Way of Building, and he looks at uh, a, a lot of American methods of building and he just talks about what he has what is it that, that makes this beautiful why is there why are people drawn to this and he goes into to a lot of detail on that so so he's one example of of someone who who i appreciate i mean he can be very dense and, and abstract, but also he can bring it down to a, a, a particular level and, and help people to look at things. Because, you know, granted, we don't have, in some ways, we don't have uh, nearly as many cathedrals here. But, you know, I think somebody like, like Ralph Adams Cram, uh, the, I mean, who's up from your way, actually. Yeah, uh, I'm familiar with him, actually who in the early 1900s he was an architectural designer and, and he designed 
buildings and, and cathedrals. He was uh, an Anglican, a high church Anglican. And so there are, he would take some of the best of the medieval style, but also he would add modern elements to it and, and have th this really interesting and, and beautiful version of architecture that it reflected. I mean, it, it was not just bringing Notre Dame here, but it was taking principles that are timeless, but also putting them into our own context. So, so, so and again, this is just one area of, of you know, sure. someone who, who can do that very well. That's that's fascinating. Actually, funny enough, I have a I have a friend. So up in my home county, which is central New York State, um, very randomly there is a tiny little church that Ralph Adams Cram designed for a family that had an estate there. And I have a friend who's the pastor of that church. Oh, really? So I I know a little bit about Cram. Actually, he's one of those great Bostonian architects. But I'm fascinated by him and the neo Gothic revival. Um, something I don't care for about Cram is that he's very critical of my beloved Greek revival tradition. Um, he has no patience for the early 19th century uh, farmhouses with uh, Greek details and proportions. Um, but I'll forgive him that because he created beautiful churches. Not everybody's perfect. Uh, he did write some good <laughs> ghost stories, I, I will say. Uh, I, I love the combination of someone who, who can do... Who, who can design beautiful things, but also who, who can write things that, that, that make your spine tingle slightly. I haven't read his stories, but I came, I came across that. It's fascinating. So, um, I, I think the whole architectural thing is such a kind of a fertile source for even understanding how, do, how does an American appropriate the classical tradition? Because I love, like I said, I love a lot of the early, my, my real love is the early Greek revival, like 1830s, 40s, farmhouses, mm. north and south. And um, one thing I find interesting, I was even thinking about this as I wrote my article, was the way that those um, often itinerant architects worked with the classical tradition. And what you, what you find when you open those manuals <clears throat> is... They're, they they spend a few chapters on laying out what the what the different Greek orders of architecture are the four I believe the four orders Doric Ionic and so forth and they talk about things like the uh, proportions right like the uh, golden golden ratio and and things like that. Um, but what's fascinating to me about that is, so they're drawing on the classical tradition. They're referencing people like Vitruvius and, and the Parthenon and things like this. Um, but then they immediately turn, unapologetically apply those principles to an American context where they're working with wood instead of with stone. Mm. And they're talking about farmhouses instead of temples. And I think there's something really interesting there, even for how they thought through um, their relationship between taking classical principles now, but unapologetically and clearly using it with American materials for American life. Right, right. That is that that's a, a, a great way of of learning to adapt. And yes, you know, as you were talking about things that are specifically American, I believe while we focus much of our classical education centers all around Greek and Roman culture and their contributions that America as we know it due to especially those who, who migrated here from Northern Europe and from, uh, from Britain we do not yet value the Norse and far far north Europe, northern European emphasis, and w how they w we we don't value the contribution that that culture has still on us today. Sure. Yeah, <clears throat> I um. There was some some interesting conversations surrounding my article once it 
wants to hit Twitter and uh, Lyman Stone, kind of a Lutheran, um, I think is a statistician, mm -hmm. but he works a lot with demographic data. He was he was talking about <clears throat> the opening that my I guess my article made for including more Norse and Germanic stuff, and I, I wouldn't take things quite as far as he did because I do think the 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 Greco-Roman nature of the tradition. The, the founding fathers are far more influenced by Greece and Rome than they are by um, ancient Germanic mythology. At the same time, um, if you look at the, the Whig theories about government and um, the emphasis they put on the ancient Anglo-Saxon constitution, there's clearly a lot of... There, I think there is more that could be done with the Germanic roots of the English language and American history, kind of going back to... Um, I think to, to, to teach American history well and American literature in, a, in an American classical school, you do need to be intentional too about how you teach English and medieval English literature because so much of that is preparatory for what comes after. Um, it's hard to appreciate, um, it's hard to appreciate the Whig theory of government and the appeals to the Magna Carta without understanding something about Anglo-Saxon kingship, Alfred the Great, and what Anglo-Saxon, what, what common law comes from, right. ultimately. Right. I know several years back there was an article uh, on in Modern Age magazine by, I think it's, uh, it's Christian Kopf uh, called The German Roots of American Order. Okay. And, and he details a, a lot of, of our, you know, the, the influence that is, yes, m much more low lying than Greek and Roman, but but it's 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 there. And in, anyway, that that's just th there's so many ways, so many different areas where where you know you could take and, and try and apply what you what you've written about. But yeah. you know, it, it's helpful at least to free people you, you, your, your work is helpful that it frees people from thinking that there's one singular form that I must follow and it has and it must be only I, I've got to study ancient Greece ancient Rome ancient Jerusalem and then you know if I happen to get to the year 1600 by the time my child's uh, graduated high school th th that's I mean, maybe, but no, there's actually good things and, and important things about knowing who we are that we should learn and and parts of our culture, as you say, you know, the mechanical arts, which we didn't even get to, but that has a strong emphasis in the United States and has part of our, 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 our original order. And even you mentioned entrepreneurship. Which is definitely uh, an American gift. That that's something that we have always done really well here. That is not touched usually in, in, in classical yes. schools. And it's not to bash classical schools. I don't mean that at all. Sure. But just these are things that <clears throat> that that we have that we should not neglect simply because we're trying to r recover what's been lost. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it's, it's crucial too. And I do want to put a plug in here for Aaron Wren's book. Um, I'm sure many of your listeners have read it, but um, Life in the Negative World, because <clears throat> he's coming at it from a religious and I guess sociological perspective. But, but he says several times throughout the book, uh, just how crucial it is that however Christians do choose in their communities to educate their children, we've got to be doing better at preparing them, as he puts it, to face the conditions of modernity. Um, just just the, the level of pressure that's gonna be brought to bear on Christians. Um, the mainline institutions increasingly being closed off to devout Christians. Uh, we're gonna be kind of forced back to rely on our own resources more and more. And we need to be preparing our children and grandchildren to be thinking very entrepreneurially. Um, not only for this, not just for the sake of strategic thinking and fulfilling life, although certainly that, but in some cases too, although this makes it sound kind of dire, for the sake of survival. Right. Um, and for the sake of transmission of the faith. 
So I think it's absolutely crucial that that American ethos of, um, eh, to put it kind of crassly, being a self-starter, um, entrepreneurial in your thinking, I think it's absolutely crucial that classical schools who do so well developing that on the character level, the virtues of self-governance and diligence. I think it's absolutely crucial that we connect the dots to help our students think through um, and help them get a leg up in doing that um, with their hands as well and with their their plans after they graduate. Yes. Well, Nathan, this is this has been really good, and and I'll certainly I'll post yeah, I've a, a, a link to to your article and, and hopefully to a few other. Uh, as, as much as I can remember, at least, uh, of different books and articles that we've, we've talked about here. But it, 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 it's helpful and it's beneficial for people who, are, who want this but, but are perhaps intimidated because, again, they, they think that they have, to, they have to become masters themselves before they can teach their kids. When most of the parents I know who do the best job are those who simply enjoy learning and they're just learning them right along with their kids and they're not ashamed of it so thank you for taking time to be with us today it's been great no it's been delightful thank you so much for having me i've, I've thoroughly enjoyed this and just pray that uh it's beneficial and get some get some good conversations going about how classical education can uh continue to mature and do what it does so well all right thank you very much The Good Life Podcast is a ministry of Trinity Reformed Church in Huntsville, Alabama. If you like this podcast, you might enjoy one of our other podcasts, Got a Minute, featuring Larson Hicks and Rich Luss. Theology, philosophy, economics, politics, and more for normal people.